um, your, your presentation. So once again, welcome everyone. Uh, let's get right into it. Uh, our first presentation uh, will be Fareda. Uh, so I'm just gonna put my timer and give you the 10 minutes. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, please make, make use of the chat, um, the chat function uh, so that we can have engagement even on the side. Uh, all these charts will obviously be saved and then we can always use them as a build up for future conversations as well. Uh, I hope everyone is going to have a good time. Let's enjoy this and let's be as comfortable as possible. Uh, so, Farida, please take the, the show. Thank you, Cuthbert, and thank you everyone for being here and especially a big thank you to Nyasha for, for working on these important publications for so long. It's, it's yeah, it is completely overdue. Um, it's, it's exciting to see what has come of, of all of the conversations and um, Nyasha's work and his dream. And I am very, very honored to be here. Um, I have written down my presentation, so I'm going to read. Um, the reason is because more often than not, I get sidetracked and kind of, you know, just go off, off the topic. So excuse me that I'm reading, but I'll try and do it as um, articulately as possible. Okay, so my title is In the Perpetual Shadow of Darkiness, Exploring the Mythology of the Postness of Apartheid. In this unique set of volumes, Mbotti aptly problematizes apartheid towards reopening what has been considered a cold case. His study traces the apartheid phenomenon before its 1948 official commencement and beyond 1994 democratization, its alleged obliteration. His arguments are thick and articulated in a convincing and accessible way, though rooted in the quotidian experience. Mbotti's volumes are expansive. He is poetic, but blunt, annoyed and angry. And the annoyance and the anger I will get into in the next section. The result is dangerous and potentially revolutionary. Apartheid studies is timely and long overdue. It be a necessity in understanding the present and navigating the future. So going forward, I'd like to um, extract some themes, um, three to be exact. The first I've titled Angry and Black on Tone. The second, Apartheid is not dead, there was no corpse. And the third, with all due respect, Madiba, what is past is not past. Darkiness economics in the present evidencing a past, not post. Angry and black on tone. Even though each argument is detailed and meticulous, Mbote exudes the patience of a Shaolin monk by laying out the variables of his arguments using mundane examples and crystal clear reasoning. What is refreshing about the tone of these volumes is Mbotti's unadulterated annoyance. More often than not, and under the, gui the, gui under the guise of objectivity and scholarship, tone is edited out when it veers toward the emotive. You sound angry, try to remain objective, is what I've been told. Mbotti acts as provocateur in many ways, antagonizing the reader to out the problem of a living apartheid. He does so by rendering widely accepted events, now ordinary, extraordinary. This said, the usefulness of emotion is under, understated in the still colonial academic scene. For one, annoyance creates urgency and pace in the text that reiterate Mbotti's words that this is long overdue. Anger is useful and appropriate in showing the magnitude of a divisively proliferating, erone of divisively proliferating erroneous uh, histories. And provocation is a necessity to make fires under those who have become hypnotized and complicit. The resultant tone builds a fair amount of tension 
which is fundamental in his rendering of mundane apartheid and apartheid hidden in plain sight, as Mboti mentions, in the early parts of his first volume. In other words, there was and is nothing grand about apartheid. It is petty, and it is as petty as they come. So much so that it permeates what we consume and how or where we should. There are policies, and then there's the lived reality of these policies, and both are fueled by deeply unethical and flawed ideology. So I, I, I use this excerpt um, quote from um, page seven of volume one, where Mboti infers, even ordinary people I heard talk about the event, and this he's referring to the Marikana murders, seemed unsure what it was that had happened or what it meant. The people seemed to be waiting for the politicians to clarify something, but nothing happened. No clarity came. The politicians were the least knowledgeable. The state president at the time, Jacob Zuma, came on state TV and deplored the loss of life, but did not seem too sure about it. To highlight, to highlight this poignant um, example, Mboti draws on his visceral encounters with a society post-Marikana. He aptly points out the deep-seated problems of a permeable and continuing apartheid via this contemporaneous iteration. He further notes that these continuities are made possible by a constitution, the, the democratic constitution in fact, that negates the very existence of apartheid and oppressive ideology that has left the oppressed reeling. However, wounds are apparent in the geographic, the communal, the familial and individual post-94. The second um, theme that I will be discussing is apartheid is not dead, there was no corpse and that um, has been taken directly from uh, Nyasha's book. The notion of a crime scene is truly groundbreaking and applaudable. Again, Mboti reveals what is hidden in plain sight. South Africa is indeed a crime scene where murder, rape and theft have reigned terror and still does. Apartheid is the crime. Mboti elaborates as the text unfolds. My take on this is a crime scene is a space that has witnessed heinous activities. The blood and guts forever stain the memories of survivors. The scene cannot easily change its status unless the victims are drugged or hypnotized into complacency or have passed away. In the case of South Africa's apartheid, the blood and guts are the result of 400 years of multiple bomb blasts that obliterated and continues to mar the black majority. This is still clearly evident in the status quo. One could say that a crime scene in some ways defies temporality as it is forever haunted by the crime itself. Hundreds of years on, we are still suffering the consequences of colonialism and apartheid. The notion of South Africa as a crime scene therefore implores us to investigate and put the persecutors on trial. Mboti's apartheid studies is a nudge in the right direction. It's a pre-trial. As Mboti suggests, persecutors must be prosecuted and pay for what they have done. Only if there is justice can the scene be vindicated in some way and the ghost exercised. So when Mandela at the same inauguration on 10 May 1994, and this is a quote from the volume, said never, never and never again, it seemed a beautiful and strategic national amnesia set in as people settled into a government assisted forgetting of what apartheid looked like and what it was capable of. By extending the crime scene idea, Mboti attempts to establish why apartheid is now a cold case. I wonder if the following should be considered. Mboti suggests that if apartheid was acknowledged as A, a crime scene, and B, living, it would be at a huge cost to the state and persecutors and the state's relations with persecutors. 
This may explain the active lack of problematizing apartheid history and continuities, as real acknowledgement and transformation would mean a greater dem demand for reparations and punishments to follow suit, an expensive endeavor to say the least. With all due respect, what is past is not past, Madiba. Darkness economics in the present, evidencing a past, not post. This is section three of my presentation. An excerpt from the volume, the name or the naming of Soweto Southwest Townships exposes the pervasiveness possessed sorry, the pervasiveness of the normative apartheid gaze. It is whites from their northern suburbs who look southwest. Ooh, sorry. Uh, I've lost my reading somehow. Give me two seconds. How do I get out of here? Um, someone is sharing something. There we go. Thank you. Um, so there are not many living beings that can grow in the absence of light or in the shadows. My title, In the Perpetual Shadow of Darkiness, alludes to the darkness ascribed to the absence of light due to, in this instance, elusive apartheid, the heart of darkness blocking the light. In Bauti's example above, the body casting its shadow is not so elusive. It is the emblematic space, Santon. In the same vein, Mboti alludes to the myth of postness as well as the political efforts to proliferate this myth. The rhetoric that apartheid is over and surpassed by a rainbow nation, which is my personal bugbear and I've written quite a bit <laughs> with regards to this rainbow nation, has been extremely damaging. Actively obliterating and negating knowledge of the past has led to a collective sense that there is an undetected aggressive cancer eating away at South African society. It has led to many a, di a misdiagnosis of the true problem where just the experience of chronic sickness is visible, of which the symptoms of violence, abject poverty and continued dehumanization. Postness is a state referring to after an event or phenomenon has included, has concluded. South Africa is not in the state. I'd like to pick up on and extend on Borti's argument that apartheid never ended, but has transformed and disguised itself to continue existing. In my view, the derogatory term... Are you done? I'll give you a minute yes. for that. Okay, I've, I'm nearly, nearly done. In my view, the derogatory term darky is a state imbued on black bodies stuck in the psycho-existential entrapment created by colonial oppression. As such, economics of darkiness maintained by the state and persecutor alike feeds off the exploitation of black bodies. Miners and domestic workers residing in the shadows evidence this. They are but one example of the lack of the desired postness. If there is no recognition of our current context of continually evolving apartheid, there is no need for a fight or revolution, and justice cannot be served. We risk that the crime scene remains undisturbed, the cold case never resolved, and the status quo of darkness perpetuated. Aluta Continua. Thank you, Mboti. Thank you so much, Farida. Uh, for that um, wonderful presentation, uh, can we just can we move on to Olivia? Good so, afternoon, so everyone. Just just a minute, um, Olivia. So when I show the the whiteboard, um, I'm only indicating that it's two minutes left. I won't type anything on the whiteboard. I hope everyone can see the whiteboard. Okay, Let's no show. problem. Um, so my name is Olivia and I'm very happy to, to have been invited to this um, conversation. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm at the moment uh, back in the UK. I'm Belgian Rwandan uh, International Relations, something like that scholar, but I just spent six months at uh, Jaius in Johannesburg. So, and I had the pleasure to uh, meet uh, Professor Nyasha there. So I'll come back to that. I um. 
I read the text, um, parts of it, and I feel like I didn't have enough time and I look forward to read the whole thing. And I'm trying to find a language not to sound too much like a fangirl because that's not helpful and we're in a professional context and everything like that. But um, the first thing I want to say is that it, it, it read like a homecoming and I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain a little bit what I mean with that. And then secondly, I will try to say something about um, how I um, read the text, the text, the provocation within my own larger attempt to engage with coloniality um, as a lens through which we try to make sense of the world and the many things that urgently need to be uh, addressed in the form of a crime scene. But I think the sense of urgency is something that also uh, compels me. Um, and then finally, maybe end on, on, on a note on um, how we know, why we know, um, and, and, and especially also the theorizing uh, around that and how I felt that this text also really brings such, a, such contributions that I, I think it's difficult to, to overstate. So I, I was asked to, to put a title and I'll read the title so that you get a sense of where, where um, I'm getting, going with this. And I think it, it follows um, very nicely on, on the excellent presentation by Farida. Um, I said beyond past, present, future, Apartheid studies as reading coloniality's violences hidden in plain sight. We can put a question mark to that or not, uh, but you know, it's part of a, a very, very initial uh, dialogue or conversation. So <clears throat> what I meant with, um, when I mentioned reading this as a homecoming, um, I think what I, mean, what I mean there is both in terms of content and in both in forms of format. And, and I would want to say that both are quite important um, points to make. In terms of content, um, especially when it comes to us trying to observe what we've been seeing in these exceptional times, the extent to which they are exceptional or not, or for whom, but let's say uh, very concretely, what, what always strikes me, for instance, when we have Black Lives Matter uh, protests, um, as an example, is the cyclical forgetting, the cyclical um, consternation at what the people sometimes call the afterlives or the continuation of the violences of racism, for instance. Again, we, we're looking at compound violences that, that extend way beyond that. What I want to say with these examples and where I found um, reading the text, A Homecoming, is that um, it, there, there is no space in the writing for this cyclical surprise by declaring, for instance, that obviously apartheid is not something from the past, but then also giving us the tools to not waste that time anymore. And so when I, when I say, when I talk about past, present and future, it's apart from obviously breaching this whole idea of the linear um, and something being able to be over or not, is very much trying to rejoin the sense of urgency because at the forefront of the text is literal, the material and all other conditions, the possibility of life or not of the black bodies um, or black bodies that, that does not give us the license anymore also within the academy uh, and especially uh, I guess also as researchers African researchers, researchers of African descent, the diaspora, however we define it, there is no, there is no time to waste. And I, I don't know, I'm not saying it in a very sophisticated way, but I think that is something um, that I want to celebrate in this text by saying it, it feels like a homecoming. Because even in our own, uh, the way that we are being trained, the spaces that we try to create to actually draw even theorists or um, attention to the urgency of what we try to address is often hindered in a very day-to-day -day basis on what is considered to be science, what is considered to be theory, what is considered. So that for me is the first part of a homecoming that I want and I would really like to explore even further. What is it within this text, the manifesto, that does not create space for wasting time and getting straight to the stuff that we're supposed to be um, addressing 
placing apartheid studies as a field of studies, but very much in the present and rejecting the fact that it's something of the past, I think is, a, is an important move. That in critical race studies, that in um, post-colonial studies, what is something that we need to take with us. And that's something for me that apartheid studies maybe does um, in the way it's been formulated here, does more effectively because for all the others, so many moves of neutralizing it have been done already by locating it first in the past as well, especially when it comes to colonialism. But racism as well, we have to do the whole dance, first of all, to prove again that it still exists. In. And when I say we and we have to, often my point of reference might be uh, a European context. But um, again, I think the fact that reading uh, apartheid studies is such a homecoming is also, I think that there is um, a, a shared experience there that, that, that obviously uh, transcends the, the, the specific locals where we, uh, localities where we are. Um, the other homecoming, as I said, was the, um, the form. Um, once we try to address the magnitude of violence in the present, whether it's in international studies or um, more the, the local studies, oh wow, already, <laughs> then um, I think what often um, the form that we're being pushed into within the academy make it difficult sometimes to express that. So what I mean with the different chapters, short chapters, but also the interventions on different cultural um, uh, instantiations, let's say, where, where you dig into a cultural archive to show this everydayness uh, of apartheid, um, very much also speaks as an invitation to try and think how can we more creatively try to address this thing that seems so huge. And I think sometimes the shorter forms, um, and, and as was announced also in the beginning um, of your introduction, that it, there is not one linear thing where you just will present a closed argument. You, there, is, there is a sense of it's a continuous thing. Um, <clears throat> let me... Um, in one minute then make the point about coloniality that I wanted to do. And I'll do it by uh, remembering two things that um, Nyesha said when we met, that stayed with me. I mean, you said many things, but that stayed with me when, um, when we met each other at Jais. One was just write, we have to write and maybe not be that afraid to not have the whole truth at a particular moment. That there's so many people out there, much more mediocre that have written so many things and then somehow to fight against that reluctance. And reading your text, the urgency, but also so packed with so many truths or myth busters. Um, I, I just, it was, I rejoiced in the fact that it's not just something you say to other people, but um, I, in terms of an example, uh, it was very much uh, an encouragement in that sense. Uh, the other one was when I was presenting on the work I'm doing in terms of um, uh, engaging coloniality when it comes to international solidarity. Um, the understanding of coloniality as compound violences of epistemicide, ecocide and genocide, you added to that the suicide. And I think uh, personally for me, this is the addition, not the addition, but the invitation that apartheid studies does alongside um, or as part of, or it doesn't even matter how we relate it, but within my thinking around coloniality, is, um, is, is the challenge on how we balance trying to make sense of the different violences and how they have been inflicted from whiteness, from uh, the Western incursions, or however we call it. But then also, how do we continue to center the colonized and the oppressed within that? And I think the logic of participation, and at that time we called it suicide, but the participation is one that I find difficult from the diaspora to engage with fully, but what I am understanding more and more as really a central point in how we should um, try to marry both the assignment of decolonizing, and I mean this in a more radical sense and not whatever we're making it of today or anti-coloniality, and then the, the need to de-imperialize at the same time as well. Let me end there. I'm taking the mic from you now. It's okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, can we move on to Anthony? Yes, thank you, Kathas, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Niasha. 
for doing this. Uh, this is uh, long overdue. Apartheid studies should have been around. There should have been departments for apartheid studies already in 1973 at the latest. That's when international law um, made uh, the International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, uh, which um, uh, says, I mean, with a few, there was, I think, six countries that, that didn't sign it, but the rest of the world wants to suppress and punish apartheid. But uh, still, there, is, uh, uh, there haven't been apartheid studies until now. So uh, thank you very much, Niasha. And it gets even worse. By 1999, apartheid became a crime against humanity in the International Criminal Court. That means it, it belongs to the, to, the, um, to the group of crimes that are the worst crimes, the ones that, that are most urgent to, to, um, to solve and to punish and to prevent and still no apartheid studies for another 21 years. So th this is uh, really long overdue. Um, I'm speaking to you from, from Vienna, Austria, the home of psychoanalysis. And I think, uh, um, Niasha, uh, you've done a fantastic job, but in the uh, fourth volume or third volume, I forget now, you uh, come out pretty hard on Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis. And, um, I think it's it's actually very useful for for um, for um, analyzing apartheid. Um, you say you point out that um, apartheid studies do not exist until now. It's that it's been repressed in a way. The study of apartheid it's not even mentioned in the South African Constitution. These are prime examples of what Freud calls repression, verdrängung. Trauma is forgotten on purpose, so to speak. And this is uh, something that causes severe uh, illness. Uh, uh, among other things, schizophrenia. Um, apartheid could be described as social schizophrenia. I went to a, an art exhibition once about uh, South African art, and it showed the early white South African artists, how they, how they painted South Africa without any black people in it, uh, mainly nature, beautiful nature, animals and white people, but no black people. This is a kind of hallucination. It's called negative hallucination in psychoanalysis. You, you're not seeing things that are there. Positive hallucinations, that's what we often uh, associate with schizophrenia and hallucinations. That's they, that you're seeing things that are not there. But negative hallucinations are just as important. You're not seeing things that are there like black people. Same with uh, the Israelis in Palestine. The, the previous president of Palestine, he said uh, that Palestine was a country without a people for a people without a country. Saying that Palestine was, was empty of people, so it was, it was uh, open for the Jews. That's also apartheid. Um, so I'm, uh, I believe that uh, the world needs apartheid studies. This is not just something for good for South Africa. This is good for the world, Palestine, Israel, uh, a lot of other places, uh, but especially uh, where people have, have suffered from apartheid and, and also related things like colonialism, genocide. Um, but I have to be a bit critical of, of uh, a bit more critical of Niash actually. And, and one of my main criticisms is, uh, is the use of modernity and the idea that apartheid is, is maximum 500 years old, that it starts with, with uh, European uh, global expansion. I think it's much older. Europe has been, has been expanding, not globally, but, uh, but uh, quite a lot uh, before then. And also, um, and that, that would include, for instance, the Crusader states. For 200 years, uh, Western Europeans, Roman Catholics, went to, to Palestine and made it uh, a Christian country, made it an apartheid kingdom of Jerusalem. All the essential elements of apartheid can be found there for 200 years as well. And it goes back further too. I've uh, spent quite a lot of time analyzing Ptolemaic Egypt, Greek ruled Egypt as an apartheid society, as an apartheid state. And uh, in that case, it actually, uh, there's, there's a, a continuation of Greek apartheid under Roman rule. Uh, 
which picked up straight away from, from the Greeks. So here we have Europeans invading an African country and ruling it with a 10% European minority for nearly 1,000 years. This is, I think, very useful for studying and understanding apartheid. It's to look Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, please proceed. I've, I've muted the culprit. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, it's, if, to, to, to study uh, apartheid in Egypt during 1,000 years, we find out, for instance, that the Egyptian language, the indigenous in Egyptian language used by 90% of the, of the population in the beginning, was gone by the end of those 1,000 years. So if, if we compare uh, to South Africa now and, and keep uh, the quote from Lutuli that, uh, that uh, Niasha used, um, by the year 2652, 1,000 years after Van Riebeck, uh, the African indigenous languages might well have been lost in South Africa. You know, they, people would have been speaking only Afrikaans, English, and perhaps some other European concoction, but not, not any living African languages anymore. These are, uh, I think, very important uh, long-term effects of, of apartheid or cultural genocide, linguistic genocide. They, they, they move very slowly, but they take place nevertheless. Um, okay, so I think the word modern uh, should go back to being just an adjective, a relative adjective, and, uh, and uh, we shouldn't make such a big deal out of what happened 500 years ago. There's, there's a deeper, uh, there's a deeper uh, background to, to apartheid. It's not necessarily European. I've only mentioned European examples so far. I think the Chinese might have uh, practiced apartheid in, in southern China and Vietnam and other places. Um, in fact, there is a, I have a, an example of black apartheid. It's African Americans coming to Liberia. This is not my uh, um, characterization, as other people have called this apartheid as well, how they have dominated indigenous West Africans in Liberia, the, the, the African Americans who moved there in 1849. They were moved there, it has to be said, though. They weren't, uh, they, they weren't uh, completely uh, all responsible for it. But, but you are responsible for your own actions. Um, okay. Um, back to, to the South African Constitution. The constitutions of Haiti and, and the US mention and prohibit slavery, Niasha mentions as opposed to apartheid in, in, uh, in South Africa. But I think uh, here's another um, critical remark I want to make, is that um, the US Constitution does not mention any crimes at all against Native Americans. And I think we, when we compare racism in South Africa to racism in the USA, uh, we should, uh, it's, it's, of course, it's legitimate to, 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 uh, to compare it to racism against blacks. There are so many examples of that, of, of, of continuation. And it's, it's as, as Niasha says, it's good to use the word apartheid for a lot of those conditions. But we shouldn't forget the, the indigenous Americans here as well, that they are, in many cases, more uh, similar to, to black South Africans. For instance, the Indian reservations are very similar to the, to the, uh, to the homelands. Um, okay, lastly, uh, the passbook is great as a central term for understanding and for fighting apartheid, but so are other terms, Niasha, such as physical violence, ethnic cleansing, theft and exploitation, civil and political and cultural rights violations. In the end, I think there are several linchpins that need to be utilized, partly independently of each other, to constitute apartheid studies and to defeat apartheid. You try to provide us with a methodological and epistemological rock bottom, which is commendable from the point of view of scientific rigor, but that rock bottom is elusive for any science, even for logic and mathematics. So there should be flexibility in this regard too, and provisions for work across disciplinary borders for interdisciplinary apartheid studies. And I'll leave it there. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Anthony.
um, and for sticking to your time. Uh, can we move on to trust? Um, yeah. You can hear me, right? Yes, please oh, go ahead. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. My name is Trust. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm, in, I'm a nurse at a doctor's convention. Uh, uh, I've um, enjoyed all the presentations that have been done. So um, instead of um, instead of rehashing uh, some of our, you know, some of the um, submissions by Mboti, what I've thought of doing is uh, making a personal reflection of what Mboti's books as how it speaks to me. Um, so that's that's that, that's what I'm going to try and do. Uh, I think I think this uh, study that Mboti uh, submits this uh, manifest on apartheid studies. I think it's a uh, first. It's a necessary contribution. Uh, it's actually shocking that up to now there had never been a study on apartheid, um, considering its impact and uh, its relatedness to other global. Uh, pandemics uh, that we have seen with the Jews uh, and other Eastern European countries. So first, my first uh, submission that this is a necessary contribution uh, 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 in not only to South Africa but uh, to the world, especially uh, considering the lens that he uses to look at um, how the world normalizes the culture of apartheid. Uh, it is. It is. This absence that explains to a greater extent uh, the nature of conversations that you find, especially in South Africa. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the political elites, how they've normalized apartheid culture. Uh, and here I'm thinking of the two immediate examples that I have in mind would be um, Helen Zille and F.W. de Klerk. Um, Helen Zille, when she tries to tie uh, the positive side of apartheid, uh, and close to that would be declared when he talks about, uh, you know, apartheid not having been a crime against humanity. That idea of thinking that you have seen being normalized that uh, that apartheid had some level, had some positive aspects of it, or it wasn't a crime against humanity, tells you uh, the importance of this or the importance of this um, contribution by Mboti because it challenges, it starts to, it helps us to start challenging uh, what we should normalize as a, as a society and also in academia. Um, and and, and, and uh, in one of my conversations with Nyasha, uh, that's what he then regards as um, two different, two, um, uh, you know, two sides of shits, right? So there's one that he calls full of shit, and these are people like F.W. de Klerk, uh, F.W. de Klerk and Helen Zille. They can say these things and normalize them. And people just say, ah, Helen Zille is crazy. Helen Zille is full of shit because she's allowed apartheid has been normalized. How she sees the world has been normalized. And then, and then what it talks about what is caused people who are uh, in shit, right? Who are predominantly black people who are, who, who, when they make the same kind of mistakes or when they make the same kind of, um, uh, you know, what I would regard as, uh, you know, or injustices, they don't get the same kind of response that people who are full of shit would receive. So, 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 so one of the things that this study would do is to turn this whole logic of normalizing people who are full of shit. You, you, you start to turn the table and, and give the same kind of response uh, that you would expect when, for example, when Zuma is a, accused of having stolen 100 million rand, uh, he, the same kind of response would go to people like F.W. de Klerk when they normalize the treatment of black bodies. Uh, so I think that's one of the contributions that the study would do. And, and uh, it, if you are looking at the global scale where you are seeing um, uh, the brutalization of African Americans, which of course is traces uh, traces of over 400 years. Uh, when you look, especially at the video that uh, 
has uh, pushed the globe to start re looking at how black bodies are treated, especially the image of uh, Derek Chauvin uh, putting his knee on George Floyd. You start to see, so in, 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 the, in, the, in the mind, in the white mind, in the white mind of the world, there is a certain uh, behavior that is acceptable, especially when that behavior is meted on black bodies. So that image of Chauvin with his knee on George Floyd's neck, uh, with, his, with his hands in his pockets, it's, it's the same kind of, uh, if you want to look at it, uh, the same kind of behavior that you even see in, in post-apartheid states like South Africa, but that is some traces of apartheid. Uh, especially when it comes to how black people are treated, you start looking even, you know, what is in countries that still uh, have maintained some forms of apartheid, like Zimbabwe, where you look at um, how uh, opposition to a certain way of life, right? Because I think one of the things that apartheid uh, study will do is to start questioning how things that we normalize as society, start questioning things that are. Um, we think should be accepted, right? Uh, and Yasha Mbodi talks about um, concepts like Rabai Magashinga, right? Uh, this idea of normalizing perseverance or normalizing hardships. Uh, this is exactly what you see also in, in countries like Zimbabwe, where even after being stretched to the very limit, you are also you are told to keep on persevering. Uh, in countries like South Africa, we normalize things like sheikhs, uh, this in human dwell, uh, uh, dwelling spaces. Um, if I, I was recently saw the launch of sheikhs in one of the provinces, um, you know, uh, where the, a, a, a sheikh building a sheikh, which is an inhuman dwelling place, uh, the government pays tenders of uh, building a single sheikh to be around 60,000 rand uh, in Lipopo province. And that tells you how the state normalize this kind of apartheid um, uh, inequalities even in dwellings. Uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I, uh, one of the things that I would want to reflect on is, um, yeah, and, and if you, especially if you look at the issue of spaces, then you juxtapose the example that Mbote brings around, uh, you know, spaces like in Samoye to Enhout Bay or Alexandra in Johannesburg sitting side by side with Senton. Um, what and, and that kind of, uh, of dwelling is, is normalized, right? Where one space uh, that is occupied by some people who belong to certain uh, classes or certain races is equal to the space that will be occupied by, by probably 1,000 uh, families, uh, which is part of reproduction of apartheid, even in post-democratic South Africa. Uh, and, and the question which I think this study will help us do is to start asking questions. Why does such kind of dwellings are allowed to, have, to continue persisting in a post-apartheid South Africa or in a post-colonial Zimbabwe or post-colonial Namibia, whatever state, right? Because I think what, what apartheid studies will do is to help us to start asking these difficult questions, uh, but also ask the contribution of the oppressed in their oppression, right? Because the problem is if you are asking only the oppressors, they always have way of uh, allowing this elasticity, right? Of telling you that you have to persevere. It's, it's um, you know, in, in, in countries like Zimbabwe, you have all these terminologies from ministers uh, which explains uh, why you have to understand uh, uh, the, why you have to understand the difficulties, things like austerity, uh, that we are implementing austerity for pos for prosperity. But only people who are poor, people who are oppressed, are the ones who are feeling the effects of of uh, those measures. And the questions that I think the study will do is to start asking uh, our, ask, you know, asking people who are oppressed. Uh, about their contribution in their oppression. Um, to what extent are we contributing uh, in the way we are being oppressed? Um, First, um, running out of time. Uh, sorry. Um, let me, 
let me let me just give one last example that I think will uh, uh, would be important, and that would be an example of uh, the battle between DBS and uh, the Khoisan in in Botswana when they were fighting over some land. And one of the things that the government of Botswana did was to to say if they were going to lose a case against the Khoisan, they were going to introduce new laws. Right? If we lose the case. Uh, on, over the land, we are going to introduce new laws that will still make it okay to take the land from the Khoisan. So, so, so that's what you start seeing with this whole apartheid infrastructure. How it's how it if there is no legislation that makes it okay to give a person 350 rand as some form of payment to survive, or to institute a payment of 3,000 as national minimum wage, even though you know that is not enough. Uh, if there is no provision for that, you will create a provision that allows for a continuous, continuous and continued oppression or continued perseverance of certain classes of people. Uh, and in this instance, uh, usually black people. Yeah, I'm going to stop you here now, Trust. Uh, thank you for your reflections. Um, if we can move on to Michaela. Uh, Michaela, um, can you, you can hear me now? Yes. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, too many buttons. Um, thank you, thank you so much for um, inviting me to participate in this dialogue. Um, I, I, I feel like there's a lot that um, Farida said and a lot that Olivia said in terms of emotion and homecoming and this kind of both the emotive and the emotional. Um, that for me. Um, really resonated when I when I read um, this, uh, like the excerpts of, of uh, Nyasha's book. Um, and for me, it kind of sparked connections with um, specifically um, what um, Michalino Sambilas has written about race as um, technology of effect. So the idea of the bodily and the emotional impact of race and racism. Um, as well as Judith Butler's idea of grievability and the way in which um, the way in which certain individuals can or cannot be perceived as um, by the state and also by by various citizens as um, either as their death being able to be mourned or not um, and so there the are two quotes that I want to kind of highlight um, that Nyasha, um, yeah, so two quotes from, from Nyasha's work that I wanted to really highlight. Um, and they're from, um, from, the second, from the second excerpt. And the one is, quote, there is just no way for me, the playground bully, to ever feel the exact pain from the scratch that I cause you. I'm thus forever locked outside the pain that I cause, and at the same time freed to cause such pain wherever, whenever I get the slightest chance. The question though is, why is it your pain when it is I who caused it? So, and then the other quote would be, observation is like feeding off scraps, or a bit like claiming that we, can, that we have seen a snake when all we saw was its atrophied skin. So for me, the, these two kind of quotes really sum up the significance of, of Nasha's book for me on a personal level. Um, and sorry, this is not very well formulated, um, but it has to do with, with the ability to recognize um, the suffering of someone, of someone else, basically. And, um, Sorry, this is very, very badly formulated. Um, so, all right. So, so this is so this is where I'm at, right? So, Nyasha puts this forward in terms of the difference between observing and knowing apartheid, specifically in relation to the past book. And for me, this really highlights something that Butler says in terms of grievability that you can only be that um, uh, 
that some individuals can only be acknowledged, whereas others can be recognized. And a lot of this has to do with the idea of humanity, who can be recognized as fully human versus who can simply be seen as present. And I think that Nyasha's, that the, this kind of tension between only being able to observe the abuses and the violent effects of apartheid is a really significant thread that has not, I think, really been highlighted in, in literature that deals with apartheid and, um, and how it's being taught. So while I think apartheid features a lot in kind of uh, high school education and also university education in terms of other subjects. So for instance, when you learn um, art history or when you learn um, the, the general history about South Africa, you know, you learn in this kind of very data driven way. You learn about facts and figures, you learn about time frames, but there's no kind of sense of the human cost. Um, and a lot of a lot of this has been written in terms of documentary photography in South Africa that rendered the suffering of black people in this country and also the ongoing suffering of, to use Nasha's term, black bodies um, in the world as this kind of anonymous suffering, this this anonymized number numbers and this kind of again less than human um, suffering, and there, there's something there's something about that inability to, to feel these bodies or to display these bodies, again, to use Nyasha's kind of relationship to the word body, um, as, as fully human. And, and I wonder if that has to do with the way in which we speak and utter apartheid, both in the past and in the present. Um, and that is for me why, why Nasha's book was, and reading Nasha's work was incredibly eye-opening because there was something incredibly emotive about it, about the storytelling aspect, about the poetry. Um, and in a, and it, it kind of educates on an emotional level that taps into something deeper than a mere historical overview of events or facts. Um, so so that, that for me was the real takeaway. And I think that tapping into that affective potential um, is maybe something that can really benefit the way in which we engage um, the apartheid, both historically and in the present. Um, and when we, when we write about it, potentially, um, and the, the one question I, I wanted to pose, Nyasha, to, to kind of um, not just praise, because I would not be a critical um, engagement, um, is to, to, think about, um, to think about the idea when you speak about the, so, so you beautifully kind of unpack that, that um, dichotomy of the, play, the playground bully and the victim and the bullied. And you quite beautifully unpack both sides of that encounter. Uh, similarly, with the with Einstein and his his light beam, almost done. Thanks, Cuthbert. Um, and so I was wondering, when you speak about um, those who do not carry a passbook, who were never forced to, and who never had to be exempt from carrying a passbook, so whites in South Africa. Um, how as a result there, it feels to me in reading it that that means that there's no living apartheid for white people. And I wonder if just to push, to push against that and question, there's definitely no living um, the abuses of apartheid, but there is living the privileges of apartheid. And so that, so living the privileges also a, a, an experience of it's a benefit of that system of oppression so that that would be the one question and i'm done thank you <laughs> thanks sorry that was very all over the place thanks a lot michaela um just in reflections uh we're moving on to you mm, thank I don't you very much okay sure no thank you very much and uh, a lot of appreciation to the preceding uh, presenters. The presentation were very engaging. 
like uh, uh, Ferreira, I would like to say that the, the, the manifesto to, for me was very provocative. It got my, my juices going. And to me, I agree with Nyasha that there is indeed a crime scene that is seemingly being ignored. We have got a couple of thousands of uh, people who managed to retain a hegemonic hold over millions of people. And uh, I think Nyasha is very right to, to observe that black bodies seem to be participating and cooperating in, 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 in being put in places in arm's way, so, so to speak. So it got me thinking, is it, there are a lot of ways in which people can participate and cooperate in putting themselves in arm's way. We, maybe, I, I, I liked the term Nyasha used when he said throwing oneself in the uh, circus of predation. We are, we, we, we are basically praying. And there's a group of people who are predating on our, on our livelihoods, on our experiences. So the question now is how do black bodies respond, respond to this predation? And I would like to draw your attention to my experiences with, with social media humor. Social media humor to me is quite interesting in the sense that people use their everyday experiences to come up with various ways in which they conceptualize their lived conditions amongst a lot of things actually. So I wanted to consider the kind of humor that is implicated in, in the discourses of identities, specifically race identities. I think we all understand, appreciate that identity itself is always in a state of flux. It's never stable. It changes over time. And the way we perceive or we construe our own identities can be... Are you hearing me? Yes, please go Hello. ahead. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay. okay. So that, I, 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 I had seen a muted mic and I had gotten confused for, for a bit. No, thanks, thanks a lot. So I'm saying that the way we conceptualize identities is represented in the kind of humor that we use. So I think one of the ways in which we can appreciate how people respond to their um, to their oppressed state in this, uh, in this apartheid, uh, we, 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 we can find those answers in, in social media humor. So it can help us to, to interrogate the various ways in which people can contribute to, to their own conditions, how people are continue to throw themselves in the circuits of, of predation. So, in, in trying now to understand the social media, social media humor, we, we begin to understand how people have got this tendency to of, of self-denigration. We understand that uh, the apartheid reconstituted and reconfigured racial identities whereby it brought about myths and stereotypes of uh, of the black person being the weaker race being the the, uh, the other race of the black people being uh, second class citizens in their own countries and we find that people are actually uh, almost in agreement with these kinds of myths and, uh, and stereotypes. And these myths now and stereotypes are captured in the ways that we 
we, we, we construct or view ourselves in the humor that we put across there. So we find that we, we have got instances whereby black bodies try to compare themselves with the whites or with white people, whereby white people are seen as the ideal kind of people. So that research sort of takes uh, on Nyasha's image or representation, the representation of the chessboard, whereby you have got the pawn that is basically uh, constrained in terms of its movement. It can only move forward, it, it, it cannot move sideways, it cannot skip, it cannot go, go backwards, it only moves slowly towards the opposition's uh, row one, and what does it do when it reaches there? All it can do is to gain promotion to, uh, to another piece, an instance which it, we see it losing its identity and so forth. So we have got a situation whereby black bodies themselves seem to have this mentality that their blackness is a case, their blackness is not good enough, their black, blackness is to be complemented with some other and to be such that they catch up to to, to the half bodies that we 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 long to be. So to me, the investigation of the crime scene can only be made possible by understanding the mentality of the of the black bodies, how black bodies view themselves. So if we understand that, we might begin to understand and appreciate the kinds of interventions that we, we need to do. The metaphor of the crime scene to me is very, is very important. Uh, the perpetrator can only be brought to book if the victim is willing to, to see or to perceive their victimhood. And if they perceive or if they understand their victimhood as it is, then they can now begin to take steps to, to make attempts and efforts to bring the perpetrator to perpetrator to book so that justice can be can be carried out. So we have got instances now whereby it's not only as simple as saying this uh, a crime scene. The question is, does the victim understand that there is a crime scene, the nature of the crime scene, and the need to bring the, to bring the, the perpetrator to book? So to me, humor, especially that tries to, or that is implicated, in the distinction between whites and blacks and uh, uh, how this kind of humor perceives uh, uh, the lived experiences of the black black of the black body the lived experiences of the half body then we can then begin to make positive steps towards trying now to being to fully investigate the, the, the crime scene. Because the people or popular participation in apartheid is a very important dimension or dynamic to, to apartheid studies. It is not only a matter of uh, us academics or of academics viewing apartheid as a, as a crime scene. So we need now to understand the various ways in which people uh, perceive their lived conditions. So the humor would, to me, some of the humor that I've been engaging with over social media would come across as if the black bodies are suggesting that apartheid itself was a favor or it uplifted the, the lived conditions of, of black bodies. And uh, people seem to be grateful for uh, uh, the or 
opportunity uh, that they got for getting civilized, uh, uh, seeing the world in a in more positive uh, lens than than they do. So, you, you, I'm going to take the mic. Um, but thank you for your contribution, uh, especially the angle thank of you. participation. Okay. Um, can we move on to Norma? Mm. Uh, is Norma Google around? Oh, yeah. You are, you are on mute. Uh, please unmute your... Unmute. Oh, cool. Okay. Hello. Greetings to everybody. I hope you all can hear me. Um, my name is Noma Uh Thank you so much for this opportunity to reflect um, on, on Dr. Mbodi's book, The Manifesto on Apartheid. Reading this manifesto was quite, quite challenging for me. I've always considered myself as a student of, of apartheid, even though it was never really formal. Most of the time when I talk about this topic, I usually reflect on my high school education and how I feel I was lied to. And Dr. Mboti captures so much of that in his book, but captures it in, in a non-emotional manner, in a manner that is... Um, in a manner that I feel we've always struggled with. It was a very, very emotional book to read. Um, sorry for that. <laughs> it was a very, very emotional book to read. It, it, it made me think about a lot of things, but in a very, in a very collected sense. Um, my, my title is Apartheid Studies, The Resurrection of Sobukwe the end of the world as we know it and our ultimate freedom. I felt that Dr. Mbotis, Dr. Mbotis analysis, his, his approach to the study of apartheid not only challenged the oppressor, but challenged the oppressed. Um, he gave us an opportunity to really end the world as we know it, because there is no way I felt you could read that book and come out the same. I had three central points that I wanted to reflect on from the manifesto. And the first point that I took from the book was the 1994 lie and how that hypnotized South Africans and how that led to, to a, a, not just South Africans, but the rest of the world. Um, and how that led to a, a people that do not that do not respond to situations that happen around them. I have a lot of examples to make, which I won't really make. Um, but we live in a society when things happened, and that's why I could relate with his argument or with his um, analysis um, about the Marikana massacre, what happened and how black people responded to it. Not just black people, but all South Africans. We responded in a manner um, that we, we responded very normal. We we. There, there was nothing moved, nothing shaped from us. Um, a lot of violence is okay to us, against us, and we usually do not respond. I used to call the 1994 lie, the 1994 nyawupe, the nyawupification of black people, where before we had black people who um, were very active against forms of oppression and post-1994, Black people no longer react. Um, I felt that was important. I want to say, uh, Dr. Mboti, I hope I'm not in trouble for what I'm going to say. I want to say that when I was printing, and that's why I felt this is important, when I was printing your book, because somehow I'm old-fashioned, when I was printing it, going to read it, somebody only saw the title and said, Apartheid Studies, what are you doing with that, Nomakuku? We have passed. What is that? And that's where I understood the importance of apartheid studies, why it must happen, why it must take place, and why a lot of us need to be decolonized, because we really do believe that it's in the past. Uh, you have movements, I made an example of the Black Wash movement of Azania, um, a movement that was in Soweto, and they had a slogan called 1994 Changed Focal. 
this slogan was not really welcomed by black people, not just by other races, but by the black bodies themselves. They did not um, accept the slogan because when you have believed in a life for so long, it is very, very difficult to accept that all along you have been lied to. And I think that is what apartheid studies is going to do. It is going to challenge our core beliefs as black people and all of us, of course. The second point that I felt was powerful and that I'm going to thank Dr. Mboti for is um, the, the idea that black bodies equals to carrying a park and that and making a passbook really, really central to defining and differentiating our oppression from different types of oppression. Because most of the time when you have these conversations, um, everybody says they suffered from apartheid or from oppression one way or another. But Dr. Mboti in his book is able to differentiate the oppressor from the oppressed and is able to, to co comprehensively argue or comprehensively dispel the lie that everybody was a victim. If there are certain things that you did not go through, you can't really argue that you knew apartheid as well. Um, this goes to Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe and why for me he became the number one enemy of the apartheid state and why perhaps he is omitted from history, why you never hear people talk about him. And this is where I felt that Dr. Mbuti was really onto something. If there was so much effort that was placed on silencing Robert Subukwe, definitely apartheid studies will probably be silenced, will probably yeah, be silenced. And hence for me, when I was reading it, I felt Dr. Mboti had come with the boldest idea post-1994. Um, and one that is really, really critical, the other lady, I think it's Ms. Olivia earlier on said, we we really do not have time anymore. Um, the way Dr. Mboti argues and poses the argument in his book about how the apartheid is not really in the past, for me says, uh, for me says Sobukwe is not in the past as well. And it made me think about a man called Mike Steinbeck, who came up with the idea of formulating the apartheid museum in the late 80s. I'm not sure if you are aware of that, that the apartheid museum was stolen, um, the trademark was stolen from him, and the Kroc brothers opened the apartheid museum. And if you've been at the museum, as Dr. Mbuti addresses this in his book, if you've been at the museum, museum you'll realize how so much of what happened in apartheid has, has been omitted from the, from the story um, told in the museum because apartheid has been told from the perspective of the oppressor, not from the perspective of the oppressed. Hence, it had to be taken away from him. And I felt that Black Bodies Equals to Passbook made Sobuka dangerous, made Mr. Mike Steinbeck and his idea of an apartheid museum owned and narrated by Black people dangerous, and therefore making Dr. Mboti's um, manifesto dangerous too as well. The third point that I, I, I found very, very, um, that I could relate with a lot was um, how Dr. Mboti criticized not only just um, whiteness, the system of white supremacy, but also criticized our response to our own oppression. And I'm sorry, can you hear me? Can you still hear me? Yes. <laughs> I hope so. Yes, okay, I'm about to conclude now. And how he how he he highlighted the fact that we are participants in our own oppression, therefore making us black bodies. I saw an argument earlier on saying that black bodies are the idea of, of a black body or defining black people as black bodies um, is not good, is derogatory. Um, I felt that any system of oppression makes people I mean, makes people non-beings. Essentially, being a non-body is being a non-being. It, it, it's being a person who is not recognized by the system that oppresses you. And I think we have to be honest, as Dr. Mbuti was honest in his, in his book about black people being a type of non-being, so that we can regain our beingness. And that means being naked, not just only. Um, stripping apartheid naked, but also stripping ourselves naked. Um, so I felt those were the three most powerful points for me. 
and those points really made the manifesto necessary. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Shoma. Um, I got mixed up along the way, um, and I skipped Remy. Uh, we can have Remy. <laughs> I'm in a meeting. Ah, <laughs> uh, Okay. Hello. Yes, we How's can hear. How's everyone? All right. It's uh, it's six o'clock in the morning. Uh, really. 717 in the United States. I've been up since four o'clock. I'm waiting to speak with you all. So thank you for allowing me to participate. Uh, it's a nice morning here, um, but there's a lot of things going on in the country. All right. Um, I met, uh, I, I'll just, I won't read the paper, but I will try to speak to a couple of points that Yasha made. Um, the first thing um, that I found interesting was his way of conceptualizing apartheid. And I think what he has done is created a, created a framework in such a way that allows for whatever studies and research that comes out of the original program to benefit people who exist under other systems, um, but not, necess not necessarily what they would call apartheid. And I think that's important because what it's going to do is going to um, decrease the perceived space between um, African descendant populations around the world. Um, and that, I mean, it will show that mostly what we're dealing with, the differences in what we're dealing with, deals with the actual physical environments that we're living in and not so much a different system. We're dealing with the same problem. And because we're dealing with the same problem, then we should be able to find some synchronicity between programs such as apartheid studies, um, Caribbean studies, black studies, African-American studies, and so on and so forth. So like I was uh, trying to explain to Henriasha, I see the growth of the program as being um, infinite. Um, one of the things, I, another thing I liked about it was that uh, he used he used metaphors and analogies that attempted to integrate some of the local language and um, wisdom into his scholarship, which is a, a vital aspect of what we were taught during my time while I was in um, University of Zimbabwe. I think, I can't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but he says, Danda Mutandi, the idea of the, the spider web and it mutating and it um expanding in all directions at the same time it kind of sounds like a, a, the birth of a, a universe or a galaxy and um this whole idea brought me back to the original point in that uh apartheid is just like a, a manifestation of the same idea so in what yasha calls the apartheid universe or the views is what i see as a apartheid universe um eventually it's going to show us a galaxy and uh, um a system of universes multiverses of the same concept or the same idea of domination of quote-unquote black bodies and quote-unquote african resources and occupation of black lands so on and so forth um i think that was an excellent uh analogy i really like that um but it wasn't a whole lot that I can say. As usual, Inyasha is very intricate and and very tedious with how he does things. So it's not a whole lot you can uh, you can add to what he's done. Uh, but I will say this last point. I think I will speak to uh, when you called it an uh, algorithm, Inyasha, and you said it was all encompassing, and you seen it as this this thing that was ever expansive and so normalized that we couldn't see it. And, but the question I have to ask you is if we probably can't see it, but you've seen it. And so do you see um, apartheid studies likewise um, becoming like a, fra a fractal and becoming self-reflecting 
and then become immersed in the peoples or or the consciousness of the people so much that it becomes its own universe in in itself. And then in that respect, uh, how do we turn similar departments around around the the black world into universes, and then we commit or we create our own multiverse. And so uh, those are basically my statements. Uh, the paper that I wrote was a little bit more intricate, but um, I'm not really you know, a good speaker, so that's it. Thanks a lot, Amy. Um, you are too modest. You are a good speaker. Uh, I think <laughs> you are so articulate and everyone understood your, your, yeah. your, your, um, your contributions. Uh, let's move on to Gently. Um, I don't know if you can if you can see me. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, cut, but uh, I'm Yentli Nong. Uh, I'm a law lecturer at the University of Johannesburg. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'm in the Kalakadi now at the moment in the Northern Cape. So I'm having issues with bandwidth. So every time somebody's going to have to switch off the video so I can have the audio. Uh, so um, just so I'll switch off my video so that I can uh, not be cut off during my uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Let me just do that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the title of, 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 of uh, I will say my thoughts, uh, is Apartheid as a Perversion of Law, Placing on Trial the Harvest of Liberation. Um, I have to add also 10 minutes and four volumes, uh, cut that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, however, uh, in this dialogue, I wanted to briefly focus and hopefully draw out conversation um, on the critical importance of this work, uh, Apartheid Studies, a manifesto, um, as well as uh, Apartheid Studies broadly uh, to law and uh, legal profession and society. Um, for me, the malleability of law as a tool for enacting social engineering is soberly demonstrated through uh, Mboti's work. Uh, the importance of the work cannot be overstated, in particular as a scholarly contribution for both present uh, and future thinking on apartheid and the intersections uh, specifically in the social science disciplines. Um, Mboti identifies as an objective of apartheid studies to focus uh, uh, or to, to, to show apartheid the door and to put apartheid on trial, close quote. Uh, it's around this objective that I wanted to engage thought. Um, in particular, I wanted to focus on two perversions of law. Um, as my title state, uh, I wanted to look at apartheid as a perversion of law. The first is the notion of apartheid as being just under the law uh, in its context when it existed. The second relates to the gift that keeps on giving our constitution as a central fruit of our liberation. And of course, it's the second perversion which critically needs to be placed on trial and litigated against, uh, in my view. And I think uh, uh, Mboti uh, makes an attempt at it. And um, in essence, uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping to, to, to lobby him further to uh, integrate law, even deepen the integration of law in apartheid studies. Um, however, but to, to, to look at the first uh, perversion, which is apartheid is just in law. Um, the schizophrenia of most, if not all, of post-colonial liberated societies is the struggle of identity between self and other, oppression and liberation. And our experiences of law is also not spared in this regard. In the context of apartheid, uh, law served as a tool of oppression, and now as a mechanism for liberation under our constitutional dispensation. It's no different from the way, uh, if I can get back to that term, black bodies have to traverse worlds um, where today is a good example for me um, in that I've left the, the comforts of, 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 of Houteng and Johannesburg and I'm sitting in the rural Northern Cape um, and how I had to move from, uh, uh, you know, an English, a uh, middle class comfort road to a Sitswana slash Afrikaans uh, dusty <laughs> existence now. Um, and, 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 and seeing how our people's lives, uh, uh, you know, change and how I have to change 
as I traverse uh, these worlds. Um, this is schizophrenia I'm talking about. And under the apartheid system of parliamentary sovereignty, uh, the national government uh, of the day sought to use the law, in particular pro its processes and procedures, to demonstrate the justness of their policies. Uh, this insidious nature of formalizing oppression through legislative processes and co-opting the structures of government ensured a lasting impact in the minds of the oppressed. So the notion of justice enunciated by apartheid has not departed the minds of the oppressed. We observe it in our daily lives where we bite into that bitter fruit of liberation and we long for a perverted sense of justice and law through words like things were better un under apartheid, uh, or at least under apartheid we could, at least under apartheid we had, at least under apartheid we were allowed. In understanding how apartheid evolved into a perversion of law, one needs to comprehend how this formalization of law distinguished it from slavery, imperialism, and colonialism. And I think apartheid studies positions itself around this distinguishing fact. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mbote recognizes uh, the centrality of law for apartheid studies in noting that, uh, open quote, without this law, apartheid studies would have been quite impossible because there would be nothing distinguishing apartheid from any other form of oppression. And secondly, there would not have been a scientific basis or a scientific definition for it, close quote. Um, this can be said to be true as far back as the Native Land Act of 1913, which although it was not part of the formal system of apartheid, it served as an initial experiment for the use of law as a tool of oppression. To this extent, uh, or to the extent that law has been uh, complicit in the origins, development and sustainability of apartheid, it needs to occupy a central role in the evolution of apartheid studies. And that's what I'm hoping to lobby uh, uh, Nyasa around. Um, I think it's only with a fixed gaze on our collective traumatic past uh, that we can move forward to create a new or novel future, which is contextually rooted. Um, I think reflecting uh, further on, 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 on Yash's work or contribution, um, the persistent and enduring challenge uh, for legal development lies in the notion of justice uh, premised on ideas such as uh, um, uh, Plato's in the Republic, uh, that justice is having and doing what is one's own, and that uh, a just man is a man just in his right place, doing his best and giving useful equivalent of what he receives. It's consequently not far-fetched to find a society entrenched in the individualistic notion of justice, ending up in Machiavellian doldrums, where the pursuit of attaining power, the individual consoles himself with this notion of justice where the end justifies the means. However, um, I question whether is there redemption or justification in the legality of white position, positionality. Uh, one has to agree with Mbote in the denouncement of Plato's divided line in that we must begin here with the fact, I should say open quote, uh, we must begin here with the facts of the darkness and the facts of the chains, not the abstractions of an external sun. Consequently, perverting the law to include the despicable to be just or justice is an issue. Um, and reflecting on my own uh, uh, privilege and position, um, as, as a law teacher, uh, I note that I'm not exonerated from the indictment. In particular, law teachers from oppressed groups who now teach law in the same spaces of oppression where apartheid, la uh, apartheid laws were formed to be just, we continue to teach law void of apartheid studies and constantly void from ourselves. Apartheid laws are brushed over in curricula and sterilized from the lived realities of the oppressed and presented only as a record of the past and attending to historic facts. Uh, as a final word, I hope to recruit uh, Professor Mbote to deepen the engagement of law in apartheid studies 
and to do, uh, and the development of this epistemology. Um, after all, apartheid is a crime, yes, sir. Uh, I, I thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Genji, uh, for the perspective from law. Um, our next speaker thank is. Thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, is Cornelis around? Uh, okay, can we accommodate um, Mose? Next, next, agree. Uh, let me see if I can manage this. I'm clocking towards my 23rd hour. Uh, it's a long stretch. It's about uh, four thirty in California. <clears throat> so if I fall asleep, you know the reason. But uh, I don't think I should. Uh, I don't think this thing will allow me to fall asleep. It's too important. Um, and in th in that sense, I will I will not uh, regurgitate the praises that have been. Uh, showered on this uh, manifesto by earlier speakers. Uh, this manifesto speaks for itself. It calls our attention to the kind of uh, battles that we need to engage on this war that uh, was long declared on us that we were misguided, some of us <clears throat> to think that uh, it's, actually, it's actually over. <clears throat> So I'm going to revolve, uh, revolve my, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. I'm going to revolve my uh, remarks on the title Koronda Simba, daring to track down the cannibals. Um, I'm kind of developing this concept from Nyasha's uh, uh, concept of Koronda that he uh, introduced at the beginning, I think in volume one. <clears throat> Because I think what we're tracking here, uh, what he's calling us to track here is uh, the footprints, the itineraries of the cannibals, but also the crime scenes, which have in many ways been uh, uh, suppressed and disappeared. Um, so it is, it, is, it is some kind of a very audacious act uh, to call us to do this work, uh, it needs a dare. So the concept of daring, uh, I also see it conceptually, uh, taking us back to the kind of council that uh, we are sitting right now, uh, because this is not a mean task. We, we really have got to put our heads together. Um, but let me go back to kind of uh, see if you can not down these questions uh, to hopefully help advance your argument. Uh, du Bois uh, pronounced that the question of the 20th century is the question of the color line, the question of race. Uh, and you are telling us that uh, the question of the 21st century is the question of apartheid. Uh, so these two uh, pronouncements um, sounded very, very poignant and uh, they relate. Uh, I don't see you uh, giving us a pathway. Uh, now your conversation is perhaps uh, developing or intervening uh, against, what are you saying about uh, Du Bois? Is this a new agenda uh, or is this uh, something that's separate? Is the question of race, the color line being resolved? Is it still a question of uh, apartheid? Or oh, that's a separate question altogether. Uh, where, uh, where is the crime scene? What are the crime scenes? Uh, are we the crime scenes? Uh, and how are they defined? Are, are they racialized subjects? Uh, native subjects. If you are natives, it means you are infrahumans. And therefore, we are crime scenes. Something else not us made us into those things called humans, because, uh, sorry, called uh, uh, natives. 
because uh, natives are not just humans, but they are things in the colonial construction of what you call uh, uh, black bodies. Uh, so this is really, you know, Dasha's call to attention. You're calling us attention through a ghost, not a thing like a chameleon or a python, shape shifts to entertain or confound its target. Uh, these creatures that we use, the very, very calculating uh, creatures. But as you know, uh, we say in the Zimbabwe cultures, Aonachi Doma, Diacharo Wanacho, Kanakut Aonachi Doma, Dechaki, Kanakana Doma, by my way, or Ritsakam Tanda. The ghost is either yours or is going to beat you up, or you are actually maybe uh, uh, a powerful healer. You're going to, to uh, catch it. So I think we know what you are here. You are a tanda. You are daring to do this work. That has got a lot of pitfalls. And I think uh, it's, it's the core that we should all join. Um, I think we should really think of ourselves as the Dari, as the Matari. You are invoking, summoning uh, Matari Ewondo, these councils of war to really uh, um, make the blueprints, uh, but also to think about uh, what, it, what it might mean to really wage uh, an epistemological, but uh, uh, a war in other ways beyond, the, uh, beyond epistems, which uh, takes me to uh, your excellent uh, analysis of uh, what I would extend to reconciliation independence. Because was that independence? Uh, because I think we're persuaded um, as a people, as things, uh, to reconcile with things that we're not reconciled with uh, to begin with. So how do you reconcile with uh, an order, an agenda, a death wish to which we are not reconciled uh, originally? So, but that idea of independence, as we know it, Chimurenga, this Chimurenga that we fought, what are its blueprints? Uh, and so, are you building uh, on to some of uh, those blueprints if they exist? Or is the, again, is this a new agenda? You are, I can see you are quarreling with uh, elders, uh, the Ngogis, uh, the Fanons. But are you also um, calling other uh, elders? Are you inviting other elders, such as the Amiko Cabraos, the Thomas Sangaras, the Samoras? Uh, those who, like you, understand that uh, uh, this battle um, uh, is, is not just about the mind, because you raise questions about uh, whether or not there is something called mental colonization. Uh, where does the pro problem reside? Is the colony in our heads now? Is it in the stomach? Where do we feel it? How do we leave it? Uh, the question of basic needs that Amiko Cabral and others uh, very, very nicely articulated. Uh, are you building onto that uh, diagnosis? Uh, because the question of basic needs, I think that's also where you very nicely extend uh, our reading of uh, the colonial rubrics of producing uh, equipment out of us. Uh, this uh, idea that a lot of scholars uh, tended to read is just infantilization. That colonialism, apartheid, these systems infantilize the other, produce the other through infantilization. Uh, but you're extending this nicely, I think, because they are squeezing boys out of grandfathers and girls out of grandmothers. Uh, that's uh, some kind of zombification. And as you know, uh, which is, uh, they've got the power to make you work forever without uh, pay, uh, that kind of zombification, which in my work I call witchcrafting, where we are produced, uh, not just bewitched, but uh, witchcrafted uh, as products imagined and produced in these labs um, uh, as things that should work as equipment for other people's profit. Uh, so how do you resolve that kind of problem? 
Uh, if you think with, I was reading uh, today, uh, you, you must know this book, Human Factor Approach to Development, Chwaura um, Mararike, where they talk about uh, the colonizers uh, uh, if you're made to swallow, to eat um, uh, things that zombify you, you can be made to vomit uh, the, the uh, witchcraft. But if a product of uh, bewitchment, uh, not just that you're made to swallow, what do you vomit? How do we calibrate the, the blueprints uh, for this new uh, liberation struggle? So those kinds of questions, uh, I don't think I still have time. Do I still have a minute? Yeah, you can use 40 seconds. Okay, thank you. Uh, because I want to address something that I had um, uh, imaging uh, throughout in the comments. Uh, what we call ourselves, I think is very, very important. Uh, a lot of you are using this term, which has been perverted. Uh, which I think is actually um, one, one uh, a sign of the boyification of Africans who made into boys. Now we talk about chiboy in derogatory terms uh, to refer to ourselves. The native, if you go back to Arnold Toynbee writing in 1934, he's not writing about Africans when he tells us what natives mean. I'm going to read this uh, quote. When we Westerners call people natives, we implicitly take the cultural color out of our perceptions of them. We see them as trees walking, as wild animals infesting the country in which we happen to come across them. In fact, we see them as part of the local flora and fauna, not as men of life-like passions as ourselves. And as seeing them thus as something infrahuman, we treat them as though they did not, have, did not possess ordinary human rights. They are merely natives of the lands in which they occupy, and no term of occupancy is long enough to confer them any prescriptive right. Their tenure is as provisional and precarious as that of trees which the Western pioneer fails or that of the big game that he shoots down. And how shall we, how shall the civilized the laws of creation treat the human game when in their own time they come to take possession of the land which by eminent domain is indefeasibly their own? Shall they treat these natives as vermin to be exterminated, or as domesticable animals to be turned into hewers of food and drawers of water? No other alternative needs to be considered if niggers have no souls. All this is implicit in the word natives as we have come to use it in the English language in our time. So this is the thing, uh, our end here. But um, again, concepts, law, uh, Leonard was talking about law right now. This is the definition of law is applied to Africans. And so how do we resolve this problem? Thank you, Mose, for the lucid presentation. Uh, we move on to, to Key's uh, presentation. You are on mute. Hello, you are still yeah. on mute. Yeah, cool. It's, it's okay now? Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, I greet you from Amsterdam. It's the other side of the globe, but it's, it's exactly the same time as South Africa, which is 1.45. But it's summer here, not winter. And But we also do, do have corona. Okay, um, I'm a professor of legal philosophy at the University of Amsterdam. And I'm also a visiting professor at the University of Western Cape. And that's how I met Nyasha. Um, so, Nyasha, your book makes fascinating reading, and it, I think it also has literary qualities. And I sympathize with most of what you say. So, I will confine myself to, to a question. And yeah, it would be nice if Nyasha could react right away. Are you there, or that's not possible? Yeah. Okay. So, hi, hi, Nyasha. Um, uh is an interview. I'm not going to let Nyasha respond. Um, I've already barred the number of people from asking questions, so it will be unfair to them. Uh, so I, I guess you can you can just um, may, maybe if he if he can respond in his last five minutes, that would be fine. But you have to yeah. Know. Otherwise, so we organized in, in the presentation of apartheid students at University of Western Cape in post-corona times. So okay. Um, 
so I'm referring to page 49 of volume one, where Niyasha writes, uh, most historians and scholars have written about apartheid, make the mistake of writing about it as if it had an Aristotelian plot. So what you're saying here is that apartheid escapes definition because it continually, continuously transforms itself and disguises itself and then emerges under another name. So it's like Hercules fighting Hydra, you know, a multi-headed dragon. And once you chop off a head, it grows back again immediately. Um, so that's the reason that you don't want to summarize or define apartheid, as I understand you well. Now, um, my question, I just gave a description of Hydra as a multi-headed dragon, then wouldn't it be still possible to uh, indicate a core of apartheid? Uh, of course, not without the pretension of reducing your book, which is rich and multi-layered to, to that abstraction, but still let me try and then I would like to have your reaction. Um, so, this would be my proposal. Apartheid is an evil consisting of an illegitimate racist hierarchy. This evil already existed in the centuries before the legal apartheid regime that was introduced in South Africa in 1948 in the form of colonial imperialism from Europe. It still exists today after the political compromise of 1994 that led to the end of formal legal apartheid. And it continues to exist first in the legacy of socioeconomic injustice, second in the legacy of mental colonialism, meaning in the indoctrination in the false idea that what is European is superior to what comes from Africa and then similar malign and suppressive hierarchies permeat world history as a whole. So my question would be, would you reject such an effort altogether or would you think it makes sense to amend it? And if so, what would you be your amendments? That's it from my side. And my compliments with your book. Thanks a lot uh, for the question uh, and uh, the, the comments. Um, I'm going to give this time to Ilva so that she can treat us to some, some poetry uh, before I give the floor to Nyasha. Ilva is on mute. Okay, sure. I'm, I'm here. Um, I'm in another meeting as well, so I'm hoping that they won't call that they will not call me in. But I will. Um, I'm hoping that I can make some kind of justice to this, um, if I can find it. Um, I wrote it only this morning, so um, it is far from a complete. Uh, it is far from a complete uh, poem. Um, it, talk, <coughs> it talks to all the four volumes of Niasha's uh, manifesto um, and links up some of the ideas that I would love to have time to talk to some other time. But basically the poem goes, a slave ship called Mandela Park, apartheid studies, black bodies, so much death, yet not deterred, no body to bury, not to mention, and yet the promise of restitution, the constitution, class actions and TRCs, apartheid studies. Time and history, fields of study and a need to clearly define them, apartheid studies, not Holocaust studies or post-Holocaust studies. Black bodies, apartheid, cheap labor, need, an addiction, imisamo yetu, efforts forgotten, Mandela's efforts, thoughts that cannot be carried out, that not really are thoughts, apartheid, real apartheid, black bodies, real black bodies, 
apartheid. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Tilva, uh, for the nice poem. Um, maybe as our last speaker, um, I'm going to invite Nyasha uh, just to give uh, a vote of thanks and maybe share one or two things uh, regarding um, how we're going to proceed in the future. Uh, Nyasha, please take the floor. I don't know how to say these guys. Um, I'm really chuffed and shook and, and, and appreciative. Um, the reason for this, uh, what Mozeko and Areo Council, is that I've been having these conversations with all of you for the last 10 years uh, at different junctures and intervals. So I don't want to say too much, just to say it attend, I thank you. Um, and thanks so much for pitching and thanks for coming and thanks for your words. Um, the other important thing I would like to